Welcome to Have You Heard, where we talk about issues at the intersection of agriculture and engineering. Let's get started. Here are your hosts, Morgan Hayes and Josh Jackson. Welcome. This is the Have You Heard podcast. This is episode 44. We're going to talk today a little bit about uh, cattle feeder designs. Since we talked about hay feeding designs last last time, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, feed as in grain or TMR feeding designs. I'm Morgan Hayes, an assistant professor in biosystems and ag engineering here at the University of Kentucky. I focus on livestock facilities and in my personal life, my husband and I farm in Boyle County, Kentucky. Uh, we have about a 500-acre commercial cattle and hay operation. And I'm Josh Jackson. I, I'm an assistant professor in biosystem and agriculture engineering as well. Uh, I focus on precision livestock farming. And for my personal life, we focus on raising, registering as cattle, some goat production, and also producing hay as well. Yeah, I like that Josh has thrown in the goat production since it's actually part of his business model. And we have alpacas, <laughs> and I do not mention them because they are not part of my business model currently. Although maybe if I get a male that can breed, I could have it as part of my business model. But currently, they're just eating grass and hay and in happy. large amounts. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get started on uh, the feed designs, let's talk a little bit about what's been happening on the farms this week. So on the farm this week, um, it was definitely challenging this weekend putting out some hay. Uh, yeah. We had we had a lot of wet conditions this past week, and the one farm only has a two-wheel drive tractor, so actually getting backed up to the barn was a challenge mm -hmm. and so there had to be some shenanigans going on uh at some point you know we just realized it's going to need geotextile fabric and rock we've known this for a couple years but you know this year has just been so so wet and the ground hasn't really frozen so yeah. as, as much as we like so challenges but putting out hay and still just working on equipment taking apart we've got one carter bar completely put together so we're two down one more to go okay well our biggest accomplishment is that we got our bull out Oh, you got the bull out. Yeah, okay. both bulls are now out. That means that we do have a controlled breeding season. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, both bulls got sold. Um, the, this bull jumped a fence a couple times in the process of coming out last a week and a half ago. Um, so he was sold. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's if other people will argue with that decision, but my theory is once they figure out how to get out, they can get out over and over again when they need to. Um, he did quite honestly, yeah, he honestly doesn't do well by himself. He was very easy to load. He's a very nice bull. He's not aggressive or anything. He just is very tall. Uh, and the fences are not that good on the least farm. So we cannot have an animal that thinks he can leave at will. So that's, <laughs> he left at our will this time. <laughs> okay. Um, and our other bull was older. He was, um, getting to the point where we were starting to have animals that we were breeding that were related to him. Um, okay. And so he ended up getting sold too. So this second bull got sold one because he jumped a fence, but also because he doesn't do well alone. And we know that, and we already knew we were going to be down to one bull uh, in our herd. So we've now sold all of our bulls and we're starting again. Um, I don't, we, you don't talk much about buying bulls cause you, you purchase semen um, and you probably keep one, herd bull sort of for a longer term, but we seem to turn over bulls much faster than we should. Um, fortunately, the market has been decent right now on the price on bulls. So we are not coming out, uh, you know, without having paid any money for the bulls, but we are getting a decent payback at on the, the end of the cycle for the bull. Um, so that's positive, I guess. That's, that's always a plus to get some return on investment from that animal and yeah i guess the market i haven't checked the bull market i don't know if it's fluctuating it's you know, sitting it's... somewhere between 90 and a little over a dollar i mean it, it's not it's not a terrible market for bulls it's not an exceptionally great market but it's not by any stretch terrible so okay um i would like to have had the bulls out have them put on a little bit of weight because they came in a little bit lighter than they probably would be because they just finished working for two months but and it's been a wet winter. I mean, it's it's been a little muddy and stuff. So, um, but both bulls are gone. We're not feeding them through the winter, which is a positive. That's true. Um, so, and we're now looking to purchase two more for our spring breeding. So we're accepting that we might bring them in early and still feed them, but um, at least we're not bringing them in with other bulls and trying to introduce bulls to bulls in the winter and, and doing that. So we're just straight up changing out to a new group. Okay. Of bulls. Um, so that's our goal is to find some in the next few weeks. But he came out 
That was a positive. <laughs> he loaded onto a trailer. That was a positive. And he sold. Um, That's, it's all positive. All these are good things. The only other thing that I think we did that was probably a, a big positive is we got weights on all of our calves that are in the barn, calves that we weaned in the fall in October um, that are going to get ready to get sold. Right now, I don't for anyone who's watching the markets locally, um, prices are very good up to 700 and they start to fall off a little bit heavier than that. And we are sitting right at that 700 mark. So those heavier steers are going to definitely be leaving this week. Um, so we got weights confirmed that we are still within a reasonable realm where we can sell a group that will probably weigh in under seven. And so we're going to go ahead and sell that group. Okay. A nice high six number on them. And yeah. also some light heifers that we're definitely not keeping. They're also leaving. <laughs> <laughs> no reason to feed them if they're not growing that well. So right. all those are going to leave the farm uh, hopefully before our next uh, podcast podcast okay. session. <laughs> I know. Like, I was listening to Kenny's Bird on speak the other night. And he was talking about, you know, there's, there was less of a price slide. I think he's saying that a lot of feed lots of potentially people in value on those calves trying to get them through but you know feed prices are going to be questionable i guess the upcoming year yeah i think it's really hard to tell what's going to happen things have been pretty in flux for a while and i don't think they look like they're going to be particularly pre predictable in the next couple months either so but he said cow cow numbers are low though cow numbers are low you and you can see people selling if you're watching sales right now you can see that the cow numbers going through the through the stockyards here are, are quite significant so yeah, I know a lot of producers, even in my county, have, have sold out just because of the, you know, fee input challenges and just the overall just challenges and the low, the prices that they're getting. Yeah, I think prices have gone up, but I don't know that they've gone up enough to compensate for the input costs going up the way they have. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 right now. Right. Um, so. But that's where we are. Um, so those are our big tasks that got done this week. Um, and neither one... Sounds like that big of a time sink. Of course, feeding and, and delivering hay also still falls into our general weekly. Weekly, yeah, just what you have to do. Business, but those were our two major accomplishments. So let's go on and talk a little bit about um, feed bunk designs. And not necessarily bunks, but feeding for TMRs slash grain feeding options. And what's sort of out there. Um, I think we're going to spend a little bit of time on the bunk design, the concrete bunk design, because that's one of, I think one thing that's pretty interesting, how it's gotten designed and how much research has gone into it, especially in the upper Midwest and Midwestern states, grain belt areas, wheat belt, those areas. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I think producers around here probably try to avoid is, you know, a lot of it's going to be what they have is fence line feeding. Mm -hmm. And so if you have infield feeding, you have a lot more challenges with the animals themselves and getting equipment in and out and through a field. So you might have them eating on both sides. However, getting equipment in and out and then having the cattle pressure around you yeah. can be a significant challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a it's a big challenge. And, you know, traditionally, I think we've seen in this state, a lot of people had those um, either just plain plastic troughs or the plastic troughs that are sitting in a, a metal frame so that sits up off the ground and people drag them around and feed in them. Usually they have a plastic trough with a, a frame around it, and then after about a year, <laughs> they have a plastic trough without a frame around it because the cattle have knocked the plastic out of the frame. Yep. And then they scrap the frame and they just drag the trough <laughs> around. Yeah. And that is, uh, to be fair, we have a bunch of them on our farm, so I and will not argue against them. They work. Um, they're really nice for, for us. We use them for our younger heifers, um, sometimes if we have to feed a bull or something, we could use it for that type of, we've got an animal that's older that just needs extra care or she's up. We can use it for that. If we need to call the animals in and out, it's small enough that we can drag it around to catch animals, to make them go places that they might not instinctively want to go. Um, but from a day to day, if I have to feed my cattle every day, that is not ideal. Yep. Um, we also, I don't know about you, but we also have on our farm sort of, this is like the simple level of feeding, um, old um, double walled uh, 12, 18 inch pipe that's been cut in half. It's more rugged than the plastic troughs, okay. uh, significantly heavier because it's a 20 foot section. Um, but, 
you know, that, that double walled corrugated looking pipe makes a really nice feed trough. It just doesn't have a good end in it. Huh. Um, but it works very well for us for feeding a larger group of animals where we know the cows might step into the feed trough. This is not yep. going to get destroyed in the same way that those plastic ones will. Uh, on the other hand, it is also still a pain to feed because just like you said, it stands out in the middle of the field and you have to figure out how to get in there, drop feed and not get killed in the process by the cows running up to eat it while you're trying to feed it. So makes you a better athlete. Don't it? <laughs> I, I have become more agile. I've actually also learned how to throw that bag so that I can get it to go most of the way down a 20 foot section of thing on a little bit of a hill, you know, 1% <laughs> slope. I can still get it to slide down there. Um, not perfectly distributed feed, but distributed. somewhat distributed feed. <laughs> and, and so that, that works too. But I mean, again, that's not what you'd ideally want to do if you were doing good design work for day-to-day -day feeding a feed. And it certainly wouldn't work if you were feeding a TMR. Yeah. Um, but, but there's, you know, one additional kind of little benefit, I think, to the um, plastic ones is that when we have winter weather, like we've had like the freezing rain and snow and kind of a mix, a slurry mix, mm -hmm. they can be relatively easy to dump out. That's right. You can turn them over, knock on them a little bit, and everything falls out, and you can flip it back over and start again. So, so sometimes they are good for that aspect, you know, for that one aspect. I will yeah. give them that. I yeah. will acknowledge that. Yeah, and I actually use one. Interestingly, I have a feed panel, like what you typically feed hay behind. And I actually have one sitting behind that for my steers that I'm finishing. And it works perfectly for four steers. I mean, okay. it's more than enough bunk space that they can all get in there easily. Because there's a panel, they can't destroy it. Right. Um, and, and it is really nice for exactly the reason you said. If there's moisture that gets in there, it can drain out. If I need to, I can flip it over, clean it out pretty easily. I don't have to try and manually get in and scoop stuff out of, of the trough, yeah. of the trough, which is nice. So, you know, and we like the fence line as well. So like for our, our mother can feed the cattle without having to get, worry about getting hurt. You know, that's important. You'd, you'd hate to have your mother in shirt <laughs> while, while trying to feed cattle for you. So uh, you she know, would let you know about it for many, many rest remainder of her life <laughs> <laughs> years right. to come. So i my, yeah. my mother or mother-in-law would certainly remind us if we, <laughs> if we got them injured feeding cattle too. So, uh, but, you know, I, like we mentioned before, so that's that's one aspect. What about the concrete, though? You know, the benefits of the concrete. To me, the concrete is a long-term solution. So if you are committed to feeding a TMR or grain feeding on a regular basis, or in this area, a lot of people will um, feed flop or distillery syrup or one of those byproducts of the distilleries because it's a free or very inexpensive product, um, and you know you're going to be doing it for years to come. I mean, concrete is a, a fairly permanent structure. You're talking at least 20 years probably on that that style of feeding. So if you're really committed to it, I think there's real benefit from a longevity standpoint of going to this style. Also, if you do a design on this, like you said, we most likely aren't going to put it in the middle of the field and have to drive in and out amongst the cattle. We can usually lay it out so it's on the edge of a of a field or a pen or something so that we can stay, keep the tractor, the equipment out of the field with the cattle. Uh, and that's a huge benefit as well. Um, but there's a lot of different styles of concrete feeding that are out there. So I would describe there's sort of three things that you can see. You see people feeding on what they would call a dairy style feeding or feeding onto an alley. Um, that's just a flat surface with some form of a panel in front of it, or at least some cabling to keep the animals from pushing in so that they can just reach in and eat off of a flat surface. Um, benefit of that is it's a flat surface. It's a lot easier to pour. Um, the challenge with that though, is animals also push stuff away from that feed, uh, far enough back that they can't reach it. And then someone has to move it back forward again. You know, the dairy industry has put up robots that actually sweep it back forward, but you know, most of the beef folks don't have those robots, so they're manually sweeping sweeping it up or shoveling it up, or sometimes they have a blade on a tractor or a ATV or something that they're using to to, to push, push it that up. Material. Um, so a little bit of a challenge there. But on the other hand, you can put out a lot of volume that way. Um, yep. And I think that's one of the reasons the dairies have chosen that style of feeding is uh, it allows them to put out a 
pretty large volume. The other ones are the bunks, and the bunks <clears throat> usually have two walls, a wall closer that the animals are eating against and then a back wall. Uh, and there's older style bunks were more square style, and then newer style bunks are J bunks where they have a taller back and a shorter front where the animals eat against the shorter side, and that taller backside doesn't keep uh, pushing feed back out of the bunk. So they don't nose it back over into the alley where you're driving, flying the feed. I know for, you know some producers that do that cow calf or like in you know the confined cow calf. I think that could be a, the back size a huge concern because some they put a lot of hay in there, mm -hmm. and the cattle throw that hay up. Yeah, and what's interesting is a lot of these J bunks were designed for feedlots out west, which is generally a higher energy ration, lower forage ration. Um, so. The rule of thumb is that, um, and this is probably from years of, of trial and error, that um, the J bunks are designed so that they have anywhere from like one and a half to maybe even two and a half, maybe even as small as one cubic foot of area per foot of length along the bunk. Um, and so if you know what type of ration you're doing and you can figure out how many times a day you have to feed it to make it fit into that bunk. Um, so there's like mega J bunks, really large J bunks, which are designed to have a higher volume uh, of feed going into them, and then there are much smaller ones. So if you were feeding just grain, you might go to a smaller style versus if you're feeding a really high forage or a high hay ration, you need a much larger bunk, or you need to go to the dairy style of feeding on an alley. Okay, gets you a little more volume that way. Exactly. So like, uh, what's what's the throat height? I know for the dairy, you know, the dairy is thinking maybe 18 inches. Well, I guess it's Jersey's 18 inches to 20, 20 inches. And Holstein's might be 20 to 22 inches, I think. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit by the size of the animal. So that's one of the interesting things around here is that a lot of times bunks are designed with a 20 or 22 inch uh, height on the animal side. Um, and the challenge is that if we start young calves on a bunk, they can't reach the bottom. They really can only handle about an 18 inch. So if we're bringing in animals at four or 500 pounds, they're never going to reach the bottom of that bunk. And we're going to have to either clean it out uh, or do something else or have a different strategy for keeping that bottom cleaned. Um, and that in and of itself is a lot of extra work. So that's another reason that people are sometimes challenged because if they get too high of that, the, the neck reach is too much for those smaller calves and some of the bunks that are out there on the market right now. All right. And as far as uh, spacing, I guess spacing between animals, I guess. And mm -hmm. so I guess it's dependent somewhat on the frequency as well of feeding. Yeah, I think it depends yeah, on the frequency of feeding and how long you expect the animals to be at the bunk. So if you want them all to hit the bunk and you're just feeding grain and they're going to clean it up in 30 minutes, they all have to have enough space to comfortably stand together so that they all eat, so they all grow. Um, and there's some data out there out of some of the western states that say like 9 or 12 inches of bunk space is enough for these smaller calves. But until they're trained to a bunk, it's very hard to get them all to eat. That assumes, I think, a higher forage ration where they're eating on it over multiple hours to make okay. sure they all get up there. Um, if we're if we're feeding twice a day and we're kind of continuously keeping something in there, we might be able to get away with a narrower uh, bunk space. But if we're feeding like a grain or something that they're going to go through very quickly, we need larger bunk space so they can all stand independently, in which case we're looking more in the neighborhood of at least... Uh, 16 18 inches 18 inches um certainly as the animals get bigger that number goes up and if we get to cow sizing or, or cow calf operations and we're feeding out of a bunk then we're looking at say three feet of bunk space per cow calf pair so um, it quite it varies quite a bit by animals but i think that this is really interesting a lot of this is you know research that was done on lots commercially done to try and figure out what's actually necessary um, but I would say most people, you know, a little bit of trial and error also, they figure out if their, if their bunk spacing isn't right, their animals won't grow consistently. And then they'll start changing their density in the barn to try and make sure that they get enough bunk space. But bunk space almost always is the controlling factor on the design of a barn. 
Okay. Um, you know, we size the length of our barn so that we have enough bunk space. And then we put our depth of our barn on there to match it, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's the controlling factor. So pretty much you figure out how many, how much space you have, how many animals can you have, and then you design the access square footage. I guess, from there. Yeah, I think that often is how that works. Uh, and if you don't do it correctly, you end up limiting your barn sometimes just based on bunk space. Um, and that can be challenging because if you, if you did all of your calculations economically for 100 head, and then you figure out that the bunk space really only handles 85 head, well, that's 15 head every turn that you're missing missing that additional hundred dollars 200 dollars per head exactly and it, and it can be it can make the barn mm -hmm. not function the way it was supposed to economically um or not function economically at all in some cases <laughs> so uh it is sort of a trick it's really i think it's really interesting though that the design on the bunk has heights on the front and the back for volume of space plus reach but it also has a width in the center of that bunk. And that's, a that's I think, to the best of my knowledge, it's a little bit about reach on the animal's neck and how far out they can clean up the bunk because they want the bunk to be able to be cleaned up by the animals themselves. But I think it's also not too narrow at the bottom of a bunk because you got to be able to go in there and clean it out. Oh, yeah. So sort of what we talked about before, you know, we don't want a narrow enough bunk on the bottom that we can't fit a shovel through there and scoop out if we have to clean out. Uh, any finds at the bottom or anything that gets wet or frozen down there we want to have an ability to get that out and i guess uh we we're thinking about these barn like these feed bunks as if they're outside and not in a barn does orientation matter is it is it a big deal or is it a it is a bit of a big deal yeah you orientation of them will play a role um with a barn you know we're looking for whether or not the sunlight is coming in um so there are some barns that have been shown that they feed on like a north and a south side of a newer barn. And what will end up is in the winter time, they'll feed very heavily on the south side. But then in the summer, when it gets warmer out, a lot of animals will prefer eating on the north side and they will see different usage based upon season. Um, so animals will sort of choose where to eat based upon the weather condition and the sun, the solar load. Also, you sometimes you want that solar load hitting the bunk to keep it dry. It's true. Um, especially if you have a lot of rainfall like we do here. <laughs> um, so all of that sort of plays a role. Um, and then, of course, the slope of the ground plays a role. So if you're doing outside feeding, you want to pick spots where the ground's going to slope away because you don't want a lot of water sitting in on the edges of the bunk. You actually want that <laughs> water and, and manure to work away from the bunk instead of towards it. That's even true for the road, I guess your gravel road for your equipment moving on. Your, yep. Your equipment. So getting that water away from the bunk as well for you to make sure your equipment can get in and out easily. Exactly. Hmm. And uh, what about the, I know some of these have adjustable bars. I know for that, you've seen those as well. Um, they can be fairly effective, I guess, for maintaining, making sure the animals stay in. Yeah. Yeah. It's called a neck height. A lot of times um, people will describe it as a neck height and, and it could be a cable, it could be a bar, it could be, um, I was just at a, a facility the other day and they actually had a cable, but then because they didn't like the rubbing on the back of the neck of the animals and all the hair being lost there, they actually put a piece of PVC over top of it. Huh. To, I mean, they can still rub on it, but they, they can't get the same wear and tear on that hair, so they don't have quite the same bald spot. <laughs> um, and and all of those are, are reasonable options. Um, what you want to do is you want to choose a height high enough that they can comfortably get their head in, but not so high that they can also get their front feet through. <laughs> yes. Um, and so you can do an adjustable one if you have a lot of different heights of animals. But if you're bringing in animals that are heavier to feed, let's say you're bringing them in at 800 pounds, you might not need the adjustable height nearly so much. Um, versus if you're bringing them in at 400 pounds, then you definitely are more in need of that adjustable height. Also, the, the alley systems, the flat systems, tend to get animals to go through a little bit more versus um, sometimes the bunks in and of itself discourages some of the animals from spending a lot of time getting in there, uh, unless they're really proficient at working into there, <laughs> in which case they might just stand in the bunk and eat until they're done. And then you definitely are unhappy because then you're <laughs> trying to scoop out and throw out the material. So I know sometimes for like uh, maybe cow calves, that could be an issue, you know, because yeah. you have your size in it for the cow, but the calf can potentially get in and 
exactly. and cause chaos. So there's yeah. something you just have to plan for if you have cow calves. Exactly. Yeah, you certainly don't want to limit it to the calf size and then not have the cow be able to eat. That would that would be a poor decision. So you have a little bit of a game you're playing there. Some some form of secondary barrier to contain the calves if they make it through is, is pretty <laughs> common. Although they rarely go very far. Almost everyone I know that has a cow-calf type feeding system, they recognize the calves can get through it. And they just accept that the calves also come back because they like milk enough that they're going to show back up yeah, to go where back, mom is. Go back to mom. <laughs> yeah. However, that doesn't make it any less frustrating when they like poop on the on the hay, yeah. on the hay or the feed alley <laughs> where you're driving. All of that makes people very frustrated, but it's just part of part of the business of having littles and bigs together, I guess. Yep, having that mixed group. So I think that's probably a pretty good summary. We didn't talk at all about silage feeding here. I don't know. It's not even on our agenda, our list of topics for the next few weeks. But certainly silage feeding systems are a little bit different than all of this. And that probably needs its own discussion on a different day. Um, but at the end there with what we've talked about with the feed bunks. And then just give a quick update, Josh, of what's happening <laughs> next week. So this next week, we're going to keep working on some equipment. So still trying to get ready for the upcoming hay season. Um, and then we'll probably move some, we're getting ready to probably move a couple uh, of our goats around. So the goats will be moving between farms, our younger goats. And then potentially... Your goats kid pretty soon, or are they... Oh, uh, we, ha we had some that, that kitted. So the ones that had kitted, uh, we're moving some of those younger ones around. Okay. And then... Uh, we have a couple more that are getting ready. So we have another group that's coming, but they'll be later on. Okay. Okay. But how about you? What's, what's happening uh, on your farm? Um, we have just personal stuff from the fire we're working through. We're moving stuff. My my parents are in town, so we're they're actually taking over the rental, and we're using their house for the interim time. So we're moving things for them this week. Um. We are going to sell, hopefully, those calves that are in the barn. Um, we also have some feeding to do, some hay to deliver. N those are not shocking things, but a little bit more robust set of feeding. Honestly, if Saturday morning is as cold as it looks to be, it may be the first somewhat frozen morning to put hay out. Yep. Uh, and if that's the case, that will be a high priority. We'll... My husband will be putting hay out, but I will be doing the other feeding tasks to free him up to do that. Okay. So that'll be a little bit of a different style of a Saturday morning for us, but we'll be out and about early if that's the case. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a, t that's a perfect time to put out the additional additional hay. Yep, exactly. That That is sort of our plan is on some of the, the ground where we don't have all of our concrete feeding areas, that that's a way that we can get some hay out early. And, and we'll the, bale graze them, I guess. Bale graze them as well, so for the yeah. bale grazing. Yeah, so we'll have enough out for maybe 15 or 20 days of bale grazing at a time. So that's a pretty significant hay allotment that has to make it out in a couple hours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our plan for the next week. We'll see if any of it gets done or all of it. And um, we will see you guys next week with another podcast. All right. Thank you. See you. Have You Heard is a production of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, along with the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Discover what's wildly possible at ca.uky.edu.